This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. I'm Jeff Dozier. Uh, I just finished my 40th year at University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, I'm an earth scientist and an environmental scientist. Microphone. Microphone, yes. And um, I had just finished a term as being the project scientist for NASA's Earth Observing System. And about a year after that, uh, Charlie was appointed to be the uh, associate administrator in, in charge of the kinds of things that we did. And of course, we were all pretty nervous about having a plasma physicist. Yeah, <laughs> obviously, from what you've seen, with good reason. <laughs> uh, but um, so uh, Charlie and I met at, at the next meeting of the American Geophysical Union, and because uh, he's, you know, trying to come up to speed with this new group of people that he's managing. And the, the thing I remembered at the time that, uh, that assuaged a lot of my worries was the fact that he was so curious. And uh, I figured somebody that's that curious can, can do a pretty good job. So I, we've organized this session a little bit differently than the others. Um, the, the moderator's not gonna go first at this point. Uh, the speakers are gonna be uh, Bill Townsend. Uh, Bill was uh, at NASA and was one of the people that knows how to put things into orbit. Uh, so I've learned a lot from Bill about how uh, rockets and spacecrafts and things like that work. Uh, the second speaker will be Mark Abbott. Mark is the the Dean of uh, Earth, Oceans, and Atmospheres at uh, Oregon State University, and was also uh, involved in the uh, Earth Observing Program. And then Francisco Valero will be the, uh, the third speaker. Uh, Francisco is the principal investigator on a, the Discover mission to put an, a, an observing satellite at uh, the L1 point. <laughs> and then, um, and then I'll be, I'll go last and I'll have the role of being the sweeper. So if there's time to make up, I can make it up. And uh, if there's things that I thought people should not, should have said that didn't, I can say those. Uh, and so uh, I'll have some remarks. So Bill, please to begin. Uh, thanks Jeff, wherever you got to. There you are, okay. <laughs> Gotta keep my eye on you. <laughs> uh, so, um, what, uh, what I want to do is, I guess, uh, start out with a story about Charlie. And, uh, uh, you know, some, uh, somebody uh, earlier said that they weren't going to tell a 1964 story, they were going to tell a 2014 story. So this won't be 1964 either, but uh, uh, Charlie and I didn't meet until 1994, about 20 years ago. But what happened was um, uh, there had been some changes that had occurred at NASA. And uh, there was a, uh, at that time, an Earth Science and Applications Division, which morphed into a new office called Mission to Planet Earth. And Charlie had been selected to head it up. Uh, at the time, I was the, uh, was the deputy. And, uh, you know, somebody made a comment about, well, I guess it was Jeff talking about, um, uh, what are we going to do with a plasma physicist? Well, I was kind of thinking, what are we going to do with a UCLA professor? But. Uh, <laughs> 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 so a little bit of the same thing. But uh, so early in 1994, he made a trip to Washington and uh, we arranged a day uh, to kind of, uh, you know, tell him who we were and what we were doing and, you know, what our issues were. And uh, we started out in the morning, uh, you know, with an overview of the program and uh, gave him a chance to meet and interact with all the people in the office. Uh, and then I invited him to lunch at the place called the Market Inn, which isn't even there anymore. But uh, we went to lunch and, um, and we had uh, some good discussions. But uh, it, you know, what I expected to happen in a private discussion like that was that I expected him to tell me that he was gonna be replacing me. 
and he hadn't done that. Uh, and so I brought the subject up myself. I said, look, I said, uh, I understand that when people come into positions like that, they like to have, you know, their own, their own people. And so if you uh, want me to move on, just, uh, you know, just tell me that and uh, I'll start looking for something else to do. And he said, why would I do that? And that's when I knew he was really a UCLA professor. <laughs> But in any event, it was the beginning of uh, an excellent relationship, and we, uh, we actually had a ball together for the two years or so that he was the head of the office. And so I appreciate the opportunity, Charlie, to work with you very closely during that time period. It was great. So what I wanted to, uh, uh, to talk about, and the question I guess I would put on the table, is uh, have we done enough uh, uh, to institutionalize Earth observations from space? Now, um, you know, Mark and, and Jeff, uh, as a minimum, I expect to kind of make the case uh, for uh, Earth observations from space. I personally think the case has been well made over, over time. And in particular, uh, you know, if we're going to try to understand climate change, which is one of the big issues of a day better, then we definitely you know, need to have a vibrant uh, program uh, observing the Earth from space. But, um, you know, have we done enough is sort of the question I'd like to ask. So I had the good fortune to be the program manager of a mission called Topex Poseidon in the, uh, uh, in the uh, early 80s. I was the program manager probably for almost a decade. And it was the first focused attempt to measure ocean surface topography globally with uh, you know, unprecedented uh, accuracy. And uh, it was highly successful. Uh, I flew for 13 years. It was designed for three. And uh, so you know, we did some things right. And, uh, and Walter Monk is in the audience here, and I believe he's going to be speaking in the next session. But uh, he said in 2002 that it was the most successful ocean experiment of all time when uh, he was uh, testifying on the subject. Um, so uh, it was a collaboration between NASA and the French Space Agency. Uh, it was uh, something that really you know, changed me personally, uh, the collaboration, I mean because I was a, uh, you know, a product of the Cold War. I lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis and all those kind of things. And so I was distrustful you know, of, uh, of things that occurred outside our borders. But uh, for 10 years or so, we worked very closely with the French. And uh, you know, I, I learned uh, what uh, you really could bring to the table when people who have similar interests, regardless of where they come from, decide that they want to work together towards a common goal. And that's what happened in this case, and that's the reason I think it was so successful. So uh, there were uh, children of Topex Poseidon, uh, Jason 1, 2, and 3. Uh, Jason 1 went about 12 years. Uh, Jason 2 is still operational, and Jason 3 is planned for launch in 2015. The result of this is, is that we've had a 22-year record, unbroken, of uh, ocean topography measurements from space. Uh, my wife and I had the uh, uh, good, uh, good pleasure of being able to attend a conference in 2012 in Venice on uh, 20 years of progress in radar altimetry. I was uh, impressed, given the way this program got going, that there were five, over, almost 600 participants from 32 countries. The other thing I was impressed with was how young the researchers were and, and the great ideas that they had for using this data to understand climate change and a variety of things. So this is an example where there has been some institutionalization of a measurement, if you will. And there are plans to keep it going. And so that's a good thing, I think, at least. So uh, Jeff mentioned EOS and the role that he played in the early days. Uh, how it kind of got going was uh, that NASA had a space station program, and there was something called Polar Platforms. And uh, I don't think they knew what they were going to do with them. And so they uh, spun them off to let somebody else worry about them, and that's what became, you know, kind of the, uh, the, the, the heartbeat of, uh, of the EOS, the Earth Observing System. And the intention there was to provide, you know, long-term global observations of uh, everything that you could do from space concerning uh, the, the Earth, the Earth system. It was originally planned as a, a long-term program. There were going to be three series of two very large spacecraft, each of them with about 15 remote sensing instruments on board. And uh, there was a companion uh, data system uh, that went with it that was very large, was monolithic. And uh, there were a lot of issues associated with the early form of this particular program. It was originally intended to, uh, to span at least uh, one solar cycle. The idea was three missions with five-year lifetime, and you'd fly it for about 15 years. 
It's not exactly what happened, uh, because what happened was is that under Charlie's guidance, the program got uh, rescoped, restructured, resized, uh, reduced, certainly, uh, and it took a different form. And it was driven by budget realities on the one hand, and then also in that time period, uh, the thinking at NASA was is that NASA really shouldn't be involved in a long-term collection of uh, data like this, that that really belonged somewhere else. In fact, the thinking then was that it belonged at, at uh, NOAA. So what evolved out of this was, uh, in terms of the primary measuring uh, systems, was three spacecraft, Tura, Aqua, and Aura, all which got launched, uh, and all of which are still operational today. There were a lot of uh, other missions, uh, contributing missions, if you will, that went along with that. And the data system got uh, totally uh, re, re uh, well, another reword, I guess, you know, re, uh, re, redesigned, maybe is a way to put it, into a distributed architecture that was very much uh, discipline uh, focused. And so it turned out to work out, uh, after some time, to work out fairly well, too. So uh, EOS is still, I would say, contributing to creating a better understanding of climate change some 15 years later. But uh, there is uh, not really a plan for another EOS at this time, so you have to ask yourself whether you know, uh, we, we have done enough here. So looking forward, the National Academy of Sciences uh, did a uh, decadal survey in 2007, uh, and it contemplated uh, a couple of things. One was is that uh, uh, a set of activities uh, under NOAA's leadership, called, currently called JPSS, uh, that the measurement suites that were planned for those missions existed and that you could then take them and augment them with other things. And so out of that came a plan for 17 discipline-oriented missions. Uh, in, in the meantime, uh, ESA has been, you know, obviously done a lot of work uh, over the years uh, of a similar nature. And currently, uh, in partnership with the European Commission, they're currently implementing a program called uh, Copernicus. Some of you may have known it as GMES. This is kind of the new name for it. But uh, it, again, is to look at uh, how, to, how to understand and mitigate the effects of climate change. Now, in this case, they're contemplating a series of six discipline-oriented <coughs> sentinel missions, and their intention is that it will continue. So uh, I guess, actually, before I go there, I should note that there have been other um, you know, attempts to institutionalize things. Landsat's a good example. We got 45 years of Landsat data, but uh, one of those missions, Landsat 5, lasted 27 years, and that's the only reason that we have 45 years of unbroken um, land observations. And that program was not planned to create 45 years of continuous data. It just kind of uh, happened into it, if you will, you know, by Sort of good luck, I would say, certainly in the case of Landsat 5. Uh, there have been some notable failures. Uh, ocean color is one of them. Uh, scatterometer winds is another one. These are things that have great promise scientifically, and they really uh, have not, uh, for whatever reason, yet been fully institutionalized with, uh, in terms of the, of the way it was originally envisioned with the measurement capabilities that are needed. So uh, what are the impediments to this? Well, the first thing is access to space. Uh, it's a topic in and of itself, and I'm not going to talk very much about it, except to note that, for example, in the Earth science area, there were two, uh, excuse me, two uh, significant mission failures uh, that occurred uh, within the last few years. One a mission called OCO, another one called GLORY. They failed um, uh, to achieve orbit. They're sitting in the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, $700 million worth of hardware. Uh, you know, totally useless because of uh, launch vehicle issues. So access to space is very, very important, and the cost of access to space is very, very important. And uh, as the cost has been rising, it tends to squeeze out a lot of good things. Missions themselves have been becoming more and more expensive. There's a lot of reasons for that, uh, but uh, it's happening, and uh, people aren't really, haven't done a lot uh, to try to mitigate that situation. Uh, you know, everything is kind of about money, so it's, uh, it's the adequacy of funding. We've heard that this morning. We heard it you know, about fusion research, and we've heard it about everything. There isn't enough money to go around, uh, and uh, things, uh, you know, you, you, you have good things to do and not enough funds to do them with is pretty much always the case. So uh, Charlie talked about, I believe, about, I think the term you used was intergenerational. So for efforts like this, they have to be sustainable, and they have to be sustainable 
in many respects. So they have to be sustainable, you know, across uh, changes in parties, you know, Republicans to Democrats, so particularly for something like our science, which is sometimes a hot potato between the two parties. And they have to be sustainable across administrations as you move from, you know, from one president and their staff to another president and their staff. They have to be sustainable across the agencies that are responsible for implementing them as the administrators and leaders of those agencies come in and have whatever views that they have that they bring to the table and, and with whatever effect that has on the sustainability of the programs. And uh, so it's, uh, it's a hard thing to do. Uh, I know that uh, uh, ESA with the Copernus program you know, intends uh, that that program will go on for a very long time. My question is, uh, will they be able to sustain it? I certainly hope they are. So there was a, uh, another academy study that was done. Uh, uh, I was a member of the panel, uh, so was Mark Abbott. And uh, this particular chart uh, ended up being a little bit controversial. That's why the red stuff is off on the far end of it. But basically, what this did is took a look at the NASA program and the NOAA program and looked at it in terms of the future if that was the plan that got executed, if that was the plan that got funded, and it was, a, and it was a, the set of missions that got flown at the time that the agency said they were going to get flown, where would we be uh, out here in uh, 2020 relative to where we were at the time the report was produced, which was 2012? And in terms of missions, you're looking at something around 20, you know, plus, plus a couple, uh, going down to uh, you know, maybe five or six. Uh, NASA, as I say, objected to this particular chart, and so they asked us to take a look at kind of a more optimistic view, and that's about as far as we could uh, get it, you know, is maybe, maybe up to eight or nine missions in 2020. But you can still see this precipitous drop uh, in capability, you know, certainly here on, in the United States. So, you know, thinking back to my experience on Topex Poseidon, and actually I had another number of uh, international experiences, you know, the, the thing that I've always thought we ought to be doing more of is that we ought to be collaborating more. And I think that's the way this is a global, climate change is a global issue, and so we ought to be approaching it, you know, more from a global perspective than I believe that we are doing. So that's, that's it. Okay, so now for your post-prandial talk, so something a little bit different. But uh, Bill set this up nicely. And I'm, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about my career and how it began to intersect with Dr. Charles Kennel and give some insights and advances that I've seen. I actually tried to follow the homework assignment from Charlie. What advances have you seen in your career and what are the opportunities? So I'll try and do that. So I entitled this Bottles for Pixels. And it started out with? A young PhD student at UC Davis going out on an oceanographic research vessel, a salmon fishing yeah. boat, uh, a lake that we like to bring script scientists up to to get seasick. That is a true story. <laughs> and, and first off, you know, we started out with, uh, you know, it's classic limnology, you collect stuff. The classic analog world of go out, collect the bugs, count them. But this in the late 70s was a transition time where a young person with more hair, that's me, uh, actually started to move into the digital world, where we move from the analog side into digital, two track, 200 BPI, seven track uh, tape recorder in the back. That was state of the art back then, uh, with all the wires and how do you get ground on a aluminum boat in the middle of a lake that is basically distilled water, a real challenge, which is why there are wires running everywhere as you try and make this work. Well, that's interesting. It allows you to collect a lot more data, but it really opens up the space-time window to look at new things and different things and different processes uh, that we had not been able to see with our bottles. And so this was taking a fluorometer, mooring it at a fixed depth in Lake Tahoe on a partly cloudy day and mapping the sunlight, the, the lower line labeled L, and then fluorescence from chlorophyll. Uh, fluorescence is emitted by chlorophyll molecules. It's a waste product, as it were, of light that gets absorbed that can't be used in the photosynthetic system. It was initially used to, to measure phytoplankton biomass, but you can see that it changes in pretty much consistent pattern, and it's the lights change change, and the degree of that response was thought to be a indication of the photosynthetic state or the photosynthetic capacity of the phytoplankton. Nobody had seen that in situ. They'd seen it in labs. This was a, a 
stimulated fluorometer uh, measuring that and we looked at different depths. Going to the digital world opened up that new kind of window. Don't kind of forget this chart, we'll come back to that in a moment. But the next part of the story was this young PhD student going to a coastal upwelling ecosystem uh, meeting at University of Southern California. Uh, Larry Breaker was there from NOAA showing satellite imagery of cold plumes leaving the California coast. Uh, never been seen before, but were seen with satellites. I was interested in that little tiny spot up there, Lake Tahoe. Uh, most of you probably know where that is, right there. Uh, Jeff works down in this area, uh, Mammoth Lake. What was interesting to me in Larry Breaker's poster was this big blob. This was Lake Tahoe's sea surface temperature, well, lake surface temperature, and you can actually sort of see that there's a cold front of water along here, and we were measuring that in our, with our uh, in situ observations, and I was interested to see the horizontal extent of what we saw as just a transect line. That data was analyzed by Ted Strube, who became a physical oceanographer up at Oregon State University to look at circulation in the lake from satellite data. And Jeff Schlatto from uh, UC Davis has now taken Aster imagery, Aster, one of the sensors on the EOS platforms, to infer large scale circulation from the sequences of these surface temperature imagery. What was interesting about this was satellite, what I saw as the advance. So the first advance was analog to digital. The second was moving from what we called in the remote sensing world, happy snaps, selfies, of sort of cute pictures that people who are real oceanographers thought were interesting but not particularly useful scientifically to actually doing quantitative science with Earth remote sensing. That to me was the second big advance that I saw in my career. The next part was to get a joint position with Jet Propulsion Lab and Scripps Institution of Oceanography to do satellite oceanography. Uh, Bob Stewart was here. I was the, uh, supposed to be number two of three but ended up being two of two. Uh, oceanographers had commuted between the two, two institutions uh, to basically build bridges between the oceanographic world and the satellite remote sensing world. Uh, these images, the one on the left of, from Coastal Zone Color Scanner, the one on the right from NOAA uh, Satellite for AVHR, Sea Surface Temperature and Color. Uh, Bill Patsert, who was an oceanographer at here at the time, said these would be the most important images of my career. <laughs> so he thought that these were interesting simultaneous images showing the intersection between physics and biology. What this led to was my involvement in a program called Earth Observing System and a sensor called MODIS. Uh, which measured ocean color and sea surface temperature. It also measured fluorescence up here from space, except now instead of an instrument stimulating fluorescence, it was using the sun as the light source. Uh, this is an image from uh, Toby Westfield and, Mark, and Mike Baron, Westbury and Mike Berenfeld up at uh, OSU where they're looking now at fluorescence. You can see in general high fluorescence, high biomass. That's the traditional use of fluorescence. But you also notice that in some areas you have fairly high biomass but relatively low fluorescence. What uh, Westbury and Berenfeld now are using this to map where there's iron limitation in the ocean, where the phytoplankton are stressed because of iron limitation and they're re-emitting more of the light that they absorb as fluorescence. So now we're actually not only measuring biomass, we're measuring photosynthetic state uh, from space. But this was when I really, uh, at this point, you know, as MODIS was being designed, I uh, ran into Charlie when he showed up at NASA. Remembering back to when Dixon Butler, about three years before, had warned the EOS Science Steering Committee, if you think things are bad now, wait if, till we ever get a fire-breathing astrophysicist in charge of NASA Earth Science. <laughs> Little did he know. But I wrote down that quote, and I can show that to you, Charlie. <laughs> And we got it, and he was a fire-breathing astrophysicist, but he really did take the program and transform it and move it forward and make it into a reality. Uh, one of the first things was that one of the EOS R's, Redesign Rescope, took place at Building T29, now known as the Martin Johnson House, where I threw MODIS T under the bus, or off the bus, and uh, became replaced by just MODIS, uh, this sensor here that had the fluorescence bands uh, on it. So that was an interesting advance of moving from analog to digital, moving satellites into the quantitative science world. 
And the other one that uh, Charlie also said is don't forget what's going on in the sort of in the water, what's going on under the ocean, the classic sort of Charlie Kennel curiosity. We can see the surface, what's going on underneath. I got a, a linked up with uh, Peter Neeler, put a bio-optical instrumentation on one of his drifters. These be then became commercially available sensors in the polar front. This is this area here, we deployed it as part of the Joint Global Ocean Flux Study, where we had bio-optical drifters uh, measuring what's going on in the water under the clouds that the satellites couldn't see. Compare that with satellite data. And I would say that's the third advance, the change in the kind of platforms uh, that we have available to us as Earth scientists. Now, this is from the Scripps website. These are the kind of Argo floats now that we have out there all the time collecting data on this ocean that we barely understand. But these new technologies now lead to a set of opportunities. And I think the platforms, and this is the, one of the first, uh, there are many of these, Argo being one, uh, the wave gliders from Liquid Robotics being another, actually developed by a bunch of high-tech industry people who wanted to listen to the humpback whales on their second homes on the big island of Hawaii. Uh, they wanted to have those kind of floats out there all the time. But now they're up to uh, model number or serial number 100. It's allowing us to sample the ocean in the middle of hurricanes and in regions we can't explore. So they're really opening up a whole range of new vistas. But the interesting thing is, can we now make these sensors and platforms smarter, like Google has done with driverless cars? Can we make these things more autonomous so we can sample the ocean and its processes and its features in areas where ships can't go or can't stay long enough? Can we finally leave what Walter calls the century of undersampling? And I think we're beginning to do that. However, when you open up the time-space window, as uh, Bill Fred was pointing out, I'm gonna skip that slide, you get into the time series problem. This is what we're trying to do with satellite data for measuring solar output from space, from satellites that were designed to do weather forecasting and string these together. And you can see it takes a lot of art to put these together into a coherent series. And sometimes the easiest thing is just to put a white plate in the lake and get a 50 year time record of how the transparency of Lake Tahoe has changed. So we can do simple things, but to get that global time series is still one of the huge opportunities and one of the challenges uh, that we have to face. But these are the kinds of things that, you know, Charlie worried about how did we work between NASA and NOAA, but he also thought about how, and you'll hear about this more tomorrow, how are these things changing how we work as scientists? And one of the things that uh, he starts to worry about is we usually just collect data, come back, analyze it, publish it, get promoted, write another grant proposal, and repeat the process. What if data is collected all the time everywhere? This is the Ocean Observatories Initiative. Uh, this is the Endurance Array off Oregon and Washington that is being deployed as we speak. These are data that are going to be on all the time, on the internet, accessible to everyone. But what if we go to another realm? What if we really do what they can do on the land where you have sensors everywhere all the time, where they're embedded out there and we have not just a few discrete sources, but we scale up to hundreds, thousands, millions of sensors that are always collected things. That's a huge opportunity space. What's interesting is what Larry was talking about this morning is here's how we look at climate modeling or ocean modeling or whatever, a whole series of components. We start to add in new processes and new features. Uh, but every one of these have a huge number of unknowns. Can we begin to couple doing the sort of ubiquitous sampling to look at more statistical pr approaches, stochastic approaches to processes such as cloud formation, rather than try and come up with dynamics that we don't understand, parameters we can't measure, understand these from a stochastic perspective, combine that with dynamic deterministic models beyond just data assimilation, but to move to a different class of models uh, where we can have a better understanding, but not just continually rely on cranking up the spatial and temporal, temporal resolution dial. There was an interesting uh, issue of uh, the proceedings of the Royal Academy last June where there were a whole series of papers beginning to look at a new class of these climate models. And this is something that Charlie, given his interest in climate and sustainability, is someone who's thought about these kinds of issues. The next issue, though, is this is our workflow still. 
Jeff remembers this. This is a map of EOS disks. This is what EOS disks looked like. Big data servers, users buried out there somewhere, a lot of dispersed stuff. This is EOS disks. If you look at what's on that function there, it's all in your iPhone. Everybody's a data server and a data user, data advisor. So these kinds of things are really gonna change our connectivity and our whole workflows and how we work. And I think this is something, again, that Charlie worries about a lot is what I'm gonna call hyper-interdisciplinarity. How do we bridge the set social and natural sciences together? How do we get policymakers and academicians to work together, technology and science? And if you look at clouds, these are the kinds of ways we're collaborating. We're doing it much more in a ubiquitous manner, coupled out with ubiquitous sensors. It's a time for interesting change, and it's gonna be interesting to see our institutions adapt. What's the role of the scientific peer-reviewed publication, promotion and tenure? And I can tell you, in the interest of sustainability, this is what happened to my 10 file drawers of reprints last month. It go, went into campus recycling, Charlie. <laughs> a huge carbon sink of paper reprints, and it's gonna be interesting to see how we adapt to that in the future. So with that, thank you very much. I'd like to start by uh, thanking the Scripps community, and in particular, Charlie, for the tremendous support that they have given us for many years, many, many years, as you can see there, uh, for uh, in carrying out the preparations for this mission. Thank you. Uh, essentially, this figure shows the history of Discover. We started work on Discover, submitted the proposal in 1998, got the approval night, at the end of 1998, there was an interruption because of other reasons completely different from NASA, uh, whatever. We have, were reviewed by the National Academy of Sciences in March 1999, which gave us a very strong support. Then NASA restarted the project. So essentially, we did all the scientific objectives definition and the design of the instruments to fulfill these objectives while we were preparing the proposal, but the actual work, hands-on work, started in April, May 1999. By January 2001, we had, with the cooperation of the Goddard Space Flight Center that built the spacecraft, we had our instruments and our satellite ready to go. So it took about 18 months with incredible savings in the cost. This thing cost very little, as compared to what it goes for satellite systems in general. So Discover is going to be the first satellite that will observe the Earth from the Lagrange 1 point. As you all know, the Lagrange 1 point is in the ecliptic plane, and if this is the, this, an L1 and L2 are points that will orbit the sun, not the Earth. This is an Earth-observing satellite, but we orbit the sun, not the Earth, but we orbit the sun with a, located at the point L1 that with an angular velocity equal to that of Earth. So we have the rate of orbiting uh, the sun will be in permanent synchronism with the Earth going across, which means that we will have the Earth in plain view from observatory at L1. And as the Earth rotates around its rotation axis, every point in the Earth will be viewed from L1. This gives us tremendously important properties, which imply synoptic view. That is, you see the whole planet at once. And as it rotates, all points on Earth are exposed to the view of at L1, and this is temporally continuous. See, it happens continuous in time. You don't have to wait 24 hours for the thing to go. You see it going continuously. These have the ability, it's important because, also for another point, which means that all the problems, the sampling, the spatial sampling and temporal sampling problems common to other satellite systems is totally eliminated, doesn't exist in this in this case. The next, so in summary, 
What we will have as unique, important points here is the continuously and synoptically monitor the sunlit side of the Earth. If we had another satellite at L2, we will be doing exactly the same from L2. We will have the same type of uh, strategy. We will apply the same type of strategy for these observations. Both polar regions are visible, and this is because there is, to go back this way, because the axis of rotation of the Earth is tilted with reference to the ecliptic plane. So from L1, the summer polar region is visible from L1, and the winter polar region is visible from L2. That is another unique property of this strategy of observing the Earth. And finally, we already mentioned that, eliminate completely the spatial and temporal sampling problems that affect other satellite systems. One of the points that we wanted to look into during the preparation of the proposal and afterwards, the science team was very interested in this, is the Earth radiative balance, which is the Earth radiative balance, the energy budget of the Earth is the fundamental driver of climate. So if you have the energy that drives the climate of the Earth comes in the form of solar radiation, you have this energy arrives to the planet, is partly reflected back to space, and the reminder is absorbed by the system. The system uses that for all the climate processes, including life itself, converts that into heat and re-radiates to a space in the form of planetary radiation in the infrared. Now, we have here one point that we want to make. The reflected energy doesn't go in a beam like the incoming energy. It goes in all directions. So you cannot measure that from a satellite. You have to look for a substitute for that. That substitute is a model. So somehow you measure what you can, and it's like every other experiment. You measure what you can, not what you want. So we have to do substitute the, obs the direct observation of the reflected radiation by some sort of model that we will see in a minute how we build that model. Uh, the Ceres, which is, have been working on this for decades, has, is the most accurate and the most sophisticated attempt to, to date to monitor the air radiation budget. However, we still have a deficit an imbalance of six and a half watts per meter square. In climate terms, this is an extremely large imbalance. And this imbalance is in the direction of heating. So if this were true, we will be living in, I tell you, a very hot planet by now. So something what we are proposing here is to do a senior, uh, an experiment, an observ observations that will integrate together, complement, and synergistically help, hopefully, to improve the situation. To do this, we have to see what other observatories can do. We have to take advantage of what they have and what Discover will have, put it together synergistically, and try to improve and help to improve the situation. Ceres, we already referred to that, measures pixel by pixel, piecemeal, one by one at a time, and is mounted in a sun synchronous satellite. So each one of the points is observed at the same time, once on the day side, one on the night side per day. So you have to this issue. But it observes this pixel by pixel at many angles of scattering, many of the angles of reflection. So these angles of reflection are then used to design a model that represents the scatter field. The scatter radiation field, the reflection field, is then uh, re replaced by this anisotropic directional model or angular distribution models, or ADM, like people call them in different ways. So Discover offers synoptic data that consists of retroreflected radiances. At, uh, retroreflectors is re radiance that are reflected in the same direction of illumination in a limited range, but at all solar elevations. Then, how can we validate this? How can we test the models? We use the model to calculate the retroreflected radiances that a totally independent system like Discover will, will observe. Then compare them, and if there is agreement, we are all happy 
the model is good, but then the difference of the six and a half watts come from something else, and then we will have to search somewhere else for that. So we compare the model to the satellite observations, to the discovered satellite observations, and that will allow us to validate these models. Up to date, these models have not been validated. They still are there. And what are the possible causes? Possible causes are the solar constant, absolute calibration of the instruments. We use two completely different instruments to do this, one in series, and what these are based on different principles that work differently. There is the issue of sampling. Series will have a sparse uh, spatial and temporal sampling, while discovery will have synoptic and temporally continuous sampling. And the models that we are using for the reflected radiance are not validated. So we want to validate them by comparing the model results to independent observations, and if they is a way to validate things and make the models more believable. I mentioned this uh, synoptic temporal continuity and the elimination of spatial and temporal samples, but there are other unique properties which are probably as important or more than this because they are conducive to a called I dream, we dream as this observational system of the future. Every satellite in existence, every one of them, geo, low Earth orbit are in the field of view of the satellite at L1. You can see them all from L1 as well as an L2, as illustrated there. So imagine the opportunity here to integrate the system and to build an observational system of the future where everything is in view. You can have coincidental measurements of everything. You exchange synergistically all the observations. And you have the moon also in view. And the moon is our reference or calibration reference. So if we do the same thing as L2, L2 will have the same properties. Then between L1 and L2, with these two satellites, we will have climate quality observations of the whole planet synoptically and continuously on time. And this is my dream. At this point, I hope that by Charlie's 90 years, we will be able to talk. I'm working on L2 now. I uh, hope that then we will be able to talk about this integrated Earth observation system, which, in my view, is the step of the future, is what's expecting us in the future. Thank you. What, when I look at what has happened, say, over the last 20 years, um, the, the two things I really want to cover is one, just the, the point of the, uh, the fact that Earth system science has become sort of a serious discipline at, uh, during that time. And the, the interesting thing about that uh, in relation to Charlie's career is this is more about Charlie's future <laughs> and what he's doing now than, uh, than these uh, great papers that he published in the past. So the the, the issue, I think, about Earth system science, and uh, Mark brought this up a little bit, is that if we look at, the, at, at Earth science of you know, 30 and 40 years ago, the, the things like the climate models were really treating the ocean and the biosphere and the hydrology of the planet as boundary conditions rather than as, as integrated models. Because in what, what we now find, if we look at the Earth, is that we can conceptualize it by this, this physical climate system and, and the biogeochemical system that are really linked together by water. And, and of course, uh, Maggie Kivelson made, you know, she showed this diagram of uh, which planets had atmospheres. But of course, the other thing that is really important about the Earth that's different than the other planets is the fact that it's got liquid water. And, and in fact, it has water in all three uh, phases. And so this view of, of looking at the Earth as an integrated system is something that really has happened over about the past uh, 20 years. The, the second point I wanted to make to, to sort of amplify what uh, my colleagues have talked about is w what has made remote sensing transformative in Earth science. And of course, from an astronomical perspective, you would say, well, of course, because 
in astronomy, that's really your only method of getting any observations. And so, but in the case of the earth sciences, you know, we did a lot of, obs of earth science before we had any sort of remote sensing. And as Mark said, when the first satellites were launched, that in terms of the pictures of the earth, they were treated more as curiosities. Yeah, that's a nice picture, it's pretty. You can make art out of it, you can hang it on your wall. Um, but what, what, what are the things that have happened that have really made, made it essential to the modern study of the earth? Well, there are a couple of things. One is the data policy, okay? So, and again, from the astronomy perspective, you, well, you, you kind of say, well, what data policy? In fact, it was, you know, when Jim Gray, uh, a famous database person, and Alex Soleil built the Sky Server, um, Jim came from the database world where he was dealing with data from banks and things like that. And he said that the really interesting thing about the astronomical data was that they were worthless. N not useless, but because they didn't have a commercial market, that it made it a lot easier to build a data system where you could share it. Well, and the problem in, with the Earth data is that there, there has been a commercial market, but in terms of doing science with the data, that made uh, those data, that, that made the science more difficult. And so one of the things that has happened, and for example with Landsat, is in 2008 the Geological Survey made the decision to make those data freely available, and, and that's the, what happened to the curve of the usage at that point. Uh, the second thing that has also happened, you know, over the, the time since Charlie was uh, at NASA, is, uh, you know, the internet came along. <laughs> so, so one of the things that, that we're able to deal with now is that the distribution system of data is, is pretty effective. So this is just an example of one of the systems. This is the USGS's Earth Explorer. But what you can do if you're searching for data from MODIS, you can go in and do a search, you uh, pick something out, you check your coordinates, you get an image of what the footprint uh, would look, look like, and then you have a list of, uh, of data products that you can download. And if you want to download hundreds of scenes, well, then there are nice things like WGET where you can just uh, poach the web and, and suck them all down uh, onto your computer. The, the other thing that has made remote sensing transformative, and this really happened with the Earth observing system, is we had the concept that we would make scientific products, what we called standard products, available. So you can look add uh, an image like MODIS, for example, and you can, you can derive things from that image. So for example, this is, uh, this is looking at the fractional snow cover for each of those pixels, and we can also derive an albedo product. But the, the problem is that in order to do this, there's a lot of arcane things you have to understand about the sensor in order to get snow or chlorophyll or fluorescence or vegetation index or anything like that. That you have to understand calibration, you have to understand issues about orbits. Um, in other words, if, if you want to actually use the data to do climate or hydrology or oceanography, you, you have to go through a very steep learning curve and a lot of processing. And so what has, the way I would sort of characterize a transformation of the earth sciences through remote sensing is that we've always had, from the beginning, we had papers and studies in what I would call remote sensing science. That is, how do you measure chlorophyll or snow or something like that from space? And what is, changed 
<clears throat> is that we still have to do that because there, we have new ideas about what we can measure from space. But now it's possible for someone who doesn't understand all the, uh, the arcana that's needed to make those products, if you really want to model the Earth system, you would like to be able to use, to, to stand on the shoulders of people who have been figuring out how to measure something from space. And so in that sense, I, I tend to distinguish remote sensing for science from using remote sensing to do science. And that has been something that took place really starting in the early 90s uh, with the Earth observing system. And so what you can do, for example, with images of snow, uh, it turns out you can tell what's covered with snow, you can tell how bright it is, but really what you want to know is how much there is, how what we call the snow water equivalent. Because uh, this, is, this is in Afghanistan and um, in 2011, there was a major drought in northern Afghanistan, but the warning for that drought came from the, uni the United Nations, the, the IRIN, the Integrated uh, Information Network. The warning came in September of 2011, after the harvest had failed. Whereas if you look at the satellite data, you could have seen that that was going to be a dry year, and you could have seen it much earlier. And so <clears throat> one of the other uh, characteristics of the Earth sciences is that the public perceives us to be important to the extent that we're useful. And again, I think that's different than the, that the, the space sciences have an advantage that these questions of the origin of life are, are, are treated as being really important questions, even though they're not particularly useful questions, right? <laughs> um, whereas we're, we're thought to be important to the extent that we can in fact make predictions, all right? So one of the things we can do then to figure out how to um, figure out how much snow is there is that I can follow these images until the snow disappears, and then I can back calculate from the energy considerations how much there must have been at a previous time. And so I can come up with an image that looks something like this. Now the problem is that this image is not useful in a forecasting sense, because I get the answer after the snow is gone. Um, but, I want you to look at the color bar on the right and notice that those numbers go up to about 2,500 millimeters of snow water equivalent. So there is a way we can make this measurement in real time in the mountains, and that's from a passive microwave instrument. That is the earth, the soil is emitting microwave radiation, not very much because we're out at the tail end of the Planck equation, but ice is a, is a fairly transparent material in the microwave spectrum, and so therefore it scatters the radiation that's being emitted by the soil and therefore attenuates it. And you can look at the degree of the attenuation and estimate how much there is. However, <clears throat> it turns out it saturates at a fairly low number. And you can see this is the microwave signal, and you can see the color bar on the right, and it's an order of magnitude less. So one of the questions we're looking at is can you, from this kind of image and other images of snow cover available in real time, can you uh, estimate what this image ought to look like? So in terms of Lou's question earlier to Larry, this is kind of a big data problem because we've got 100, you know, hundreds of these images available for whole time series. And there's a lot of interesting spatial statistics involved in trying to answer the question. And the last remark is that uh, this image is, uh, is from some of the work that Ty Brandt is doing, and Ty is Charlie's nephew, so. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, um, so thank you. And what I'd like is if the rest of the panel could come on up, because I think we have time. Do we have time for questions at this point? Yeah. So, Mark. And Bill Townsend spoke earlier about Topics Poseidon, which he quoted me as saying the most successful oceanographic experiment of all time. I need to share with you an awkward story. <laughs> a, few, a few years before Topics Poseidon went up, Bill Appel came to Scripps to tell us that we were going to be able to measure surface, ocean surface topography to a precision of a few centimeters. And he wanted to ask the audience as to what could be done with that data. And he received total silence. And he went back to Washington and he wrote a letter saying that a leading Scripps oceanographer, and it wasn't me, <laughs> told him that he wouldn't know what to do with the data if he had it. The best thing I can say for Scripps for being so totally unreceptive on that is that he next went to Woods Hole and had a similar reception. <laughs> Well, when he went to, when he went to Woods Hole, is this on? He must not have talked to Carl Wunsch, because Carl Wunsch was a firm believer in that time period. So this is a quest, question looking towards the future. Do you see Earth observing shifting from sort of large, big satellites to kind of the limit of, you know, these uh, CubeSat type observing, where you have multiple satellites? I think you're the one. Yeah, well, you know, I, I wish it would, uh, and uh, I, I'll just give you my opinion on that subject. Uh, what has happened here, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, from a launch vehicle perspective, the launch vehicles are very big. And so, uh, just talking about NASA, NASA has, I believe, a tendency to try to fill you know, the volume of the fairing and the mass capability of a lift of, of the launch vehicle with as many instruments as they can pile on. And, uh, and, and I'm not saying that's bad, but it leads to very big missions. And so uh, when uh, Vasilius was talking this morning about the CubeSats, you know, I've done some work uh, my own in the small sat world, not as small as CubeSats. And I've had conversations with NASA, and there's just no audience there. And uh, they, they, uh, they they're, uh, seem to me to be into big and, uh, you know, what, what you might call flagship missions uh, almost. I mean, that's my opinion. Uh, and I haven't worked at NASA for a decade, so that may not be NASA's opinion, but that's my view of, of uh, you know, of what I see going on. It's actually it's a great question. Dave, I don't know whether this is not on. Anyway, it's a great question. In fact, our committee next week at the or next month at the Academy is looking at that question, but I think Bill touched on it. There are some technical issues, but there are interesting things you can do with a lot of the Landsat type of injury with smaller sensors to get a shorter repeat time. But the big, big barrier is more cultural and technical than or technical, more cultural than technical. For example, the NASA centers depend on big missions to support workforces. Little satellites, little sensors, it just doesn't support the huge overhead burden that you see at the NASA Center. So that's one of the reasons they just don't like it. Hey, hey, this, go ahead. This mission, Discover, for example, was uh, accepted by NASA when the idea was to have smaller satellites, cheaper satellites, and with direction from universities. That's what Discovery was born. That's why Discovery had only two instruments, the air cycle. Then other things were added to it. But the fundamental mission was the air sciences mm -hmm. and having a spectral radiometer, a telescope with a spectral radiometer, and a, 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 an active cognitive radiometer. And that was it. That's why we were able to build that thing with little money, really little money, and very fast. And the speed saves having to pay. 200 engineers to be sitting there for 25 years. This thing was being 18 months done, finished. But then it was sitting there. I'd say you, you, <clears throat> one wants to be a little bit careful 
in that there are some aspects of physics that don't follow Moore's law. <laughs> okay, um, optics, uh, for example, and and the other is that there are <clears throat> there are regions of the spectrum that are not covered by the sensors that are used in digital cameras. So, in particular, when you get in to regions beyond 11 or 1200 nanometers, then you end up running, you have exotic detectors that tend to have to run cool. Mm -hmm. And so one of the problems with very small satellites is, you know, how, can you in fact run a, a focal plane at, at 60 degrees Kelvin or something like that? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the, the, I think the advantages that Bill mentioned are great. That, you get a lot of the repeatability if you can launch more little ones than one big one. But you need to, a, a lot of the concepts of the CubeSats right. depend on having a mothership also available. But a small sat can get you, must be able to get you to, say, yeah. Charlie. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to comment a little bit. I think that the experience that we had on the Earth observing system is uh, instructive, and it took us maybe 30, 40 percent of the way towards a, a CubeSat dominated philosophy. But I should just point out that the Earth observing system, when it was first conserved, uh, conceived with the six repeating missions and so on, was going to be the largest scientific experiment ever conceived. Its run out cost was going to be $18 billion. Uh, it's a lot less than ITER, but that $18 billion was that the project was unstable to implosion, and it soon imploded within two or three years of starting at the policy level. So the question was then what to do. And the argument at that time had been that you need all 24 instruments on each spacecraft so that they could look at the same uh, spot of Earth and sky simultaneously and get all the correlations correct. That is to say, to get all the data integration and build it into very expensive hardware. So what, with uh, multiple conflicts require, co requirements conflicts because of merging 24 spacecraft on uh, instruments in one spacecraft. So the idea then was to rely on the scientists and rely on data processing to do the integration and not put everything into the hardware. And so what we did was we split it up into three or four missions that are now considered large, plus a whole variety of smaller ones that did supplementary uh, observations. And we relied on the data set. We distributed the data system, made it much more broader and co comprehensive. And we relied on data management and assimilation and intelligence to integrate the data rather than to put it all into hardware. And so I think that as you go further into the distributed and CubeSat world and the, co the capabilities of big data that we'll hear about from Larry uh, increase, we will find places where lots of small sensors will take the place of, a, of an extremely large system. And we've also, and in addition, the cooperative means of working together as scientists have gone way up through the use of the internet and rapid data exchange, our mental integration processes, person to person, are much faster than they had been. So I think this is all, a, that EOS was instructive, it got us there a little bit of the way, and there's much, much more uh, to be gotten. And I'd just like to point out that when the astronomers build their telescope, they don't cast one mirror. They rely on cooperative behavior between hundreds of mirrors and in the case of radio astronomy, lots of distributed measurements, and they've gotten that way and built large, they beat the laws of optics by cooperative instrumentation. So I think, uh, I think that, uh, that we may go there in the future, and, but it will require, as you point out, new social conceptions, new administrative conceptions before it can happen. Charlie, would you think then that there is space and room for both types of satellites? Large satellites and small ones. Uh, it's, it's, uh, understood that some experiments require a large system, but other experiments can do with smaller systems and coexistence of both systems. And this is the endless battle that is fought out on the Space Studies Board of every. <laughs> 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 I do find that 
that balance with Why the Why eliminate one or the other? Because you can't have both. Oh, you, you both are the money. You, 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 you absolutely have to do both. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, you, um, you mentioned the moon as a possible calibrator for Earth observing, and I recall that there was some program to use Earth shine on the sort of dark part of the moon as a monitor of uh, secular changes in the albedo. Did anything ever come of that? Because I think it was about 200 years worth of data or something. Uh, well, there was some problems. I do not exactly recall what the problems specifically were. But that approach had some problems. Maybe if you give me a little time, I can check out my memory. You are getting old by now. But, <laughs> uh, but there were some issues with that. I cannot, you know, solve the issue, convince me, and forgot about it. Just look at it in a different direction. Maybe that was a mistake. But uh, one, more for the audience. Uh, one, one more question, and then uh, we get our oh. Yes, um, in Boston, I have the coordinator of something called the Boston Energy Forum. We have distinguished people from all sorts of fields. And one function of us is to spy on you. In other words, uh, the, the government asks us from time to time, how much should we rely on your prediction? You touched that subject that you cannot quite predict. You also indicated that your models are quite limited. And could you expand on that? In other words, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I. <laughs> I, I think um, one of the one of the earlier speakers, I think, made a distinction between some things are pretty easy to predict, and and some things no, are really difficult. Yeah. yeah. Well, they. No, there, there are some things where I think the predictions are, um, are, are better. So for example, I think if, if you can give me a, a scenario of the CO2 concentration and the aerosol concentration over the next 50 to 100 years, then I can give you or our models can give you an estimate of the temperature progression during that time. Yes, our models would have some uncertainty, but the number that we would come up with is probably more re robust than the number you're giving me. Right. <laughs> okay. So in terms of the, of the climate of the next half century to a century, the biggest source of uncertainty is the human behavior. Okay. I think we'll stop at that point. Very good place to stop.